Awesome, I'm so super excited for our first panel, guys. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Natasha, and I will be moderating all of our panels today. So I just want to give you guys a quick intro to who I am. I am the co-founder of School of Bots, which is the one-stop shop for all things chatbots. And we have taught over 2,500 people how to market, sell, monetize, and build chatbots. And if you want to learn more about this, you can just go to schoolofbots.co. So with that, I am really excited about this panel in particular um, because I think the talk about just the general ecosystem of the bot world and what it all means is very under-talked. And so I'm excited to have all of you guys here with us um, and get your insights on what the ecosystem looks like right now and what it could look like over the next few years. So before we jump into that, um, if we could have each of you introduce yourselves, let us know your name, what company you're from, and what you're working on at the moment. Hi, so my name is Ofer, and I'm the general manager of Chatbase, which is at Google. And um, historically, we've been doing chatbot analytics, and have done that for half a million bots. But we have a new product. Our second product is really um, looking at historical calls and live chats with humans, human agents, in order to figure out what is the right bot to build. So we use machine learning to like tease out the top use cases and how those conversations go. And it's a good way to create a smart bot. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Ilker. I'm co-founder and CEO of Bot Analytics. Uh, Bot Analytics is a conversational analytics tool uh, for conversation products like for small bots, enterprise uh, uh, bots. And uh, we are analyzing any kind of conversations uh, for small bots. It's really simple conversation flows. We are getting understanding and for mid enterprise and enterprise uh, on customer support calls uh, to sales calls uh, we are getting understand and uh, putting out on a chatbot and then we are analyzing the boss side thank you hi everyone I'm Lauren Kunze I'm the CEO of Pandora bots we're a very large self-service platform for building and deploying chatbots we add about 4,000 developers to the platform every month and those include individual hobbyists to developers inside some of the biggest brands in the world. And we also partner with brands directly to help them build out more complex chatbot applications. Hello, uh, I'm Rob from Google. I work on our business messaging products, so opening up um, native messaging, other uh, messaging surfaces on mobile devices to enable business to consumer interactions of through bots, through uh, live agents, and through hybrid experiences. Awesome. So with that, my first question for you guys from a 30,000 foot view, um, so very broad, what use cases and verticals are you guys currently working with in bots, and what are you having the most success with? What are you guys seeing right now? And feel free to pass the mic around. Or... Uh, I guess I'll go first, because I've got the mic. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I think verticals, um, I think it's maybe, I, I, certainly the top three that we're in uh, would be finance, travel, retail, not necessarily in that order, but I think they're, they're sort of common in, in, the, in the use case. I think it's, um, you know, I like to think of verticals as sort of a, a blank sheet of paper. It's interesting seeing, you know, we do things in healthcare, we're doing things with government, we're doing things uh, with carpet cleaning, with massage groups, you know, the, 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 the the, the sectors are very broad. I think it, it's, you know, you take that conversational surface and there are lots of ways of, you know, if you've got a website, if you've got an app, typically you can, you can move at least some of those functions into a conversational mode that has better utility for the, for the user. Um, you know, we just launched with, uh, with Citibank last week, so using native messaging to be able to check your balance to see recent transactions um, without having to go through the... Uh, the hassle of logging into a, a, an app or a site, you know, and to get sort of those notifications to be able to respond to them instantly through messaging. Um, you know, I'll talk through some of these use cases later, but, uh, you know, a retail, you know, buying a product, being able to, uh, you get sent a, t a picture of the table that you bought last week and you're asked to rate it and you can just hit uh, chips, one star, two stars, three stars, four stars, five stars, rate that product and you're done with one tap. There's no email, there's no password, there's no logging into a website. So lots of, uh, of utility across platforms. 
Yeah, like Rob said, carpet cleaning, definitely top vertical. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm a little surprised to hear you say finance just because uh, on our side, we've seen fintech and healthcare lagging a little bit due to their being highly regulated industries. But I think they're definitely starting to catch up, even if they're a little late to the party. Um, for us, we had a thesis a couple of years ago and picked one major brand partner to go deep in certain verticals, and those were CPG, um, car, specifically in car and voice, um, insurance, uh, shipping, retail and e-commerce, and then customer service. Um, I think right now in terms of what's driving the highest volumes on our platform, and by that I mean about 100 million messages a day, we're seeing in the shipping and customer service sector. So that, those are kind of the top use cases where we can kind of point to the company or the use case and say, we've saved this company millions of dollars every month. Um, but we're definitely starting to get there. Um, and I think the market is finally here. Uh, on, our, on our case, uh, we are seeing some uh, different type of verticals. Uh, if we start from the mid-enterprise and enterprise side, uh, we have banking cases. And uh, one of the banks we are working with is Ish Bank, and uh, uh, at the first place, they it, it, it was a very early stage. They put a chatbot on their web page and get thousands of uh, comments and uh, uh, feedback from their customers, and then they put it in their mobile phone, and uh, they started to transfer money from accounts to accounts. And I think uh, the banking side uh, will ship in a really rapid way what I see in a two years way. And uh, we are analyzing their data. Their uh, first approach is to uh, cost cuts uh, because they put their uh, chatbot on their uh, at first place website. They uh, decrease the traffic on the website traffic and directly to the cost cut on the customer support side. And now uh, we are, uh, as a botanist, we are uh, in, um, analyzing their uh, customer support calls, and uh, we are saying that hey, this agent really works well, and this agent really uh, works poor performance, and we are putting intents, and uh, they are making their chatbot more intelligent than analyzing uh, those data and improve their chatbot experience. Uh, I think uh, the banking side. Uh, uh, will improve in a, in a rapid way in the next couple of years. And on the small cases, uh, what I see on the messenger case, there are tons of uh, businesses uh, want to get uh, increased revenue on their, especially on the e-commerce side. Uh, there are some great examples on the Shopify. Uh, they want to increase uh, their revenues with their Facebook channels because millions of their followers following their Facebook page. But uh, uh, if you put uh, or, or transform the Facebook page experience to chatbot, uh, chatbot flow, uh, you can easily increase the experience and the revenue, and you can decrease the abandoned cart rates, and it's really important on e-commerce, and with chatbot experience, you can make it happen, and I think uh, last couple of years is really increasing this kind of cases, what I see. Um, so, so yeah, what we're seeing is that the regulated industries like banking and insurance use more open source NLP solutions and, and um, do on-prem um, as they get more comfortable with cloud. They are shifting towards cloud solutions. But pretty much every company, you know, almost every company I talk to is building some sort of bot. So the more interesting question, I think, is the use case that Lauren alluded to. And, and we did a survey of 5,000 bots and found that 55% were customer service, 22% were uh, marketing and sales, and like 12% were e-commerce. So customer service is currently, for every vertical, the top use case that they start with. And just as an example, we're working with a Fortune 20 that's trying to save over a billion dollars by doing this kind of work. So you can imagine how important it is to get that right. Yeah, absolutely. So some of you guys have been in the bot space for quite some time, Lauren, <laughs> and all of you guys. Um, but having seen all of the chat bots, you know, grow across multiple platforms, which messaging platforms do you see growing the fastest over the next, you know, one to three years? Okay, I'll start. So I, I'm a big believer in using existing channels. So if you're you know, Fortune 500, you already have a website and an app that gets like often millions of users, and that's often your main channel for reaching your customers with a bot. So we're seeing those kind of companies 
build bots and use that channel to help their customers. Uh, you know, and, and I think that's going to be, uh, you know, will continue to be like a main channel. I think you can supplement it with the other third-party platforms like Facebook, but, but uh, definitely if you have a major channel like that, you should take advantage of it. Yeah, actually, uh, the main channel should be the, uh, basically the web page of the enterprise or the company because you're getting the most traffic on the website. And the uh, crucial thing is uh, just build this really smart assistant. It, you can say chatbot, you can say bot, but you just create a really smart assistant and just decrease the traffic load. I think this is the, uh, 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 what we see. <laughs> Uh, all of these uh, people, you want to see this case, uh, and uh, the first part is I think the simpler web page. Yeah, not to be redundant, um, we had a lot of brand marketers suffering from shiny object syndrome who were really eager to rush to Facebook Messenger, and then they found out that none of their users were there, or they didn't know that there were bots on Messenger. Um, or built an Alexa skill because they thought we have to have a voice strategy and then surprise, most of your traffic is on your website. So for us, that's still far and away the number one deployment channel. We have a really easy to set up little web widget that takes five minutes to put it on your site. Um, since it's always fun to make predictions so people can come back to you two years later and laugh at how wrong you are, um, I'm gonna go ahead and say that I think in a couple of years, we are going to see um, SMS and RCS and Apple iMessage as the top channels that matter and WhatsApp. Um, those are, I think, going to be competing for the top spot in the messaging sector and Facebook Messenger might shake out as number four. Um, I was just down at Mobile World Congress in LA with Rob and I heard something that was really amazing from a brand, um, Walgreens, they said this on stage, so I'll repeat it. Um, of all of their digital channels, and they have mobile app, they have email, um, they have a messenger bot, they said SMS is their fastest growing channel, which is shocking if you think about everything that's wrong with SMS. Um, it's not secure, it looks terrible, um, and we're benchmarking. We have retailers who are doing SMS messaging for marketing on Facebook Messenger, and the click-through rates are much, much higher when you add like simple rich media elements, like Rob was mentioning, where you can tap a card, you know, 25% click-through rates. So it's obvious that that's where it's going, but it's still kind of crazy to think like what the open rates are with SMS and how that continues to be a dominant channel and a multi-billion dollar industry. So it's important to make predictions and be wrong and be surprised. So you guys can come back to me in two years and, and laugh, or we can celebrate. <laughs> uh, I, I'm with you, Lauren. Um, the, um, yeah, I don't want to repeat things that other people have said. I think it's important to meet your customers where they are. So I don't, don't try and create a new channel and, and change your, your customer's behavior. Find out where they are and, and, and meet them there. Uh, Google's making a big bet on on native messaging, what, what we think of as text messaging today and what's evolving to be RCS, rich business messaging, and, and, uh, and I'll talk more about that later, but I think we're making that bet because that's where users are. It's on the hope that that app is on the home screen of, of, of users' devices, and that's, you know, it's a place where they're used to interacting with businesses today, so we're, we're trying to make that experience better for, for businesses and for consumers. You know, I think it's interesting, you know, Lauren, to your point about, about financial, I think they are reticent, you know, they are very regulated and they're slow moving, but I think they're also very frustrated with, with, with apps. I'd push back against the notion that you should build this into your app or your website because consumers don't necessarily want to be there. Like if you're a bank, you know, probably less than half of the bank's customers have got the app and less than half of those people have got notifications switched on and that banking app's on screen seven of the phone. It's, very, it's a hard place to have a, a conversation with the customer but they are using messaging or uh, WhatsApp or other channels. So, so meet them there and, and, and try and build the experience there is, is I think, uh, uh, a, a good principle to start with. Yeah, fantastic, Rob. I think that's a great point and actually leads into another question I wanted to ask is, how would you guys describe the needs of users right now that bots can fulfill, and how do you think those needs will change over the next couple of years? Uh, you know, I think... Uh, Ofa's answer was a good one, and I, I like that it was, it, there were sort of numbers there, you know, 55% of, yeah. of, of bots are around customer service, um, and I can't remember the rest of the numbers, but I think, I think that's, that's, that's telling. Like, I think, you know, people have questions. You know, none of us want to pick up a phone and call Comcast or want phone a retailer and send a product back. That's painful. We're all busy. We've all got overscheduled lives and, 
and, and getting lost in an IVR tree is, is, is painful. So how do you build that, you know, some, some automation, some bot around that, that customer service interface, I think is, uh, is a good place to start. You know, I think those, uh, you know, what I think of as transactional use cases. So, um, you know, you want your carpets cleaned, you want to book a massage, your dentist appointments tomorrow. Like, how do you, how do you start kind of conveying those bits of information and, and opening up that to a conversation so you can listen to a response, you can change the dentist appointment, you can provide driving directions or whatever those things might be. How do you, how do you take those bits of utility and then start to build a, a conversational experience around them, I think is, is, is another great place for, for brands to start. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier, you know, high, high volume use cases. We have a shipping client who, like I said, is doing about 100 million messages a day. And they actually had a mandate from their users to be able to um, track packages and schedule redeliveries on Line Messenger. This is a Japanese shipping company, so that's the dominant messenger in Japan. Um, and that's really what you need to look for, as Rob was saying, when you choose a channel, is where are your users asking you to meet them? And because people were actually saying, you know, this is very painful, I have to go into my email, I have to go into your website, I have to look up my tracking number and log in and go back and forth, and I, why can't I just text online? And that's a little bit rare that you have such a strong actual mandate from users. But because they were asking that and now they can send a simple text message to re-deliver, um, schedule re-delivery, um, you're resulting in huge savings. So I think customers will ask you. They just want to be able to get something done quickly while they're doing everything else. Uh, yeah, I can, I can share a stat. Um, what I see on the Facebook Messenger site, uh, the uh, biggest retention comes from the entertainment bots. Uh, the people really uh, stick into these entertainment bots and really using them. Uh, rather than some specific brands on the uh, Facebook site, they're really in up-to-date, like every two months, three months, updating their conversation flow experience and uh, putting some products, and uh, they're really getting their user retention. This is another case. It's, it's developing uh, right now, but uh, other than these cases, I think uh, what we see in numbers, the entertainment use cases getting uh, good retention on the user side. So I think it's fortunate that the most common bot use case support also happens to have a lot of data that you can use to build a, you know, those support experiences. Um, I'm a big believer in, be, in speaking naturally to bots, not filtering yourself, just speaking the way you would to a human. Um, and the, the way I get to that vision is to see how do two humans talk about these problems that come up in support cases and then model your bot based on that. And so you can anonymize all the support data and have that inform your bot. And I think that's like a good way to move forward and get to that, you know, to, to what Hollywood shows us, you know, where people are just talking to computers and they understand us. Fantastic. And with that, I don't want to run over time. And I also want to give you guys um, a couple chances to ask some questions. So firstly, thank you so much for all of your insights, guys. That was fantastic. Please give them a huge round of applause. <laughs> And now, I don't know how much time we have left. Um, ten, minutes. 10 minutes? Okay, Mike. perfect, cool. So any questions, feel free to raise your hand and he will bring you the mic. Nobody wants to know about the future of bot. There we go, no, okay, here we go. One here and in the back as well after. Here you go, sir. Yeah, interested to hear a little bit more about the entertainment bots and why you think these things have such retention, what is the interaction, what's the dialogue look yeah. like? Because uh, in, in the entertainment boss, there are a uh, lot of free UI templates. So uh, it goes most of the time with a uh, lot of buttons and free UI templates rather than the pure AI or, yeah. Yeah, I was going to add, I forgot to mention entertainment and language learning as um, use cases that are taking off, but we're actually seeing a lot of... Um, like non-player characters and games getting enabled, and, and that's a really big use case. And seeing some cool stuff um, on like the avatar side that marries speech to text and text to speech, um, and artificial emotions, and very very cutting edge. We're not done. Okay. 
I'll just well, I'll just add, because we, we did a study and found that um, the average turns for a bot is two, like two turns of the conversation, and that the like expert bots were that maybe teach you something um, or help you diagnose something, uh, they had six turns on average, so a lot more than the, the median. Um, and so that's another area where you see a lot of engagement. Yeah, I mean, one of the most popular general like conversational bots on our platform, Mitsuku, which has won the Loebner Prize, which is a Turing test a number of times, actually averages at 64 turns per conversation, um, which is really good for like um, a marketing, advertising, entertainment, engagement use case, but not something you'd want to see in a customer service scenario. Then you probably have a very angry customer. Uh, Sid, since we talked so much about um, customer service, um, you know, I guess to play devil's advocate, you could argue that sort of even today's bots are conceptually very similar to the IVR. In other words, there's some intent classification to the top, and then you send the customer to sort of a pre-coded tree of some sort, although maybe it might be more sophisticated. And you could also argue that maybe 10 years from 10 years ago, when you went to like call center week, people praising RV IVR had very similar kind of objectives and dreams and, and things to say about um, gains in customer service. So what do you think is really going on? Why is this time really do, like actually different? With the, what's, what's the real dimension with which today's bots are actually better than the IVR? So that's a great question. Um, I think the, the catalyst for the current market hype cycle is actually a shift in consumer behavior and not a technology breakthrough um, to messaging, which is really important. Um, you know. AI in general as an industry suffers from silver bulletism, which is the tendency to think that the latest techniques are the be-all, end-all breakthroughs. And today's silver bullets are deep learning, um, specifically neural nets, which have led to massive breakthroughs in historically hard AI problems like image recognition, computer vision, speech-to-text, text-to-speech. But they have not yielded the same results for natural language understanding or natural language generation. And it's unclear that machine learning alone is going to solve conversation. I think even characterizing like conversation as something that you can solve as an engineering problem might be the wrong approach. Um, so we're still a couple of years, if not a decade, away from computers that can actually understand us. Um, there have been some breakthroughs, so we're definitely smarter than IVR systems. But as you probably know from bots that you've chatted with, um, there's a lot of button-driven bots as well. Um, I think the second, you know, brands are more comfortable with that because the second somebody goes off script and the bot fails, they have a bad experience. But I'm with Ofer. I think, like, we should be pushing toward the vision that removes buttons as a stopgap. And the only way to do that is with a lot of data and the understanding that automation is a long-term investment. And most of the work happens after launch as you start gathering that data. So, you know, three months out after going live and continuously updating, you might get to 80%. Um, but there are still a lot of bad bots out there and a lot of noise that are turning consumers off. So, yeah, we did a project where we analyzed 95,000 live chats for like a large company. And we found for one of the use cases, 3,300 ways of asking for it, someone wanting a payment plan. So when you have like that much data around how people phrase that question, that's really powerful. You can uh, increase uh, detection you know, of, of that uh, request. And then beyond that intent launching, not only do we find like the ways the conversations go, but we find all these one-off questions that come up that take you off of the conversation, but then you need to come back. So all these things that come up along the way, all that richness creates a much better user experience than your IVR tree experience. One second. Uh, automation is a long-term investment. Hashtag, what was that hashtag? Chatbot conference. Oh, sorry. I want to make sure that I'm ready for the participation after the panel. Jonathan, you have a question. I forgot my question. Um, no, I didn't. Uh, I'm particularly interested in the medical industry and uh, specifically patient care. And I'm wondering, I don't know a lot about chat bots, but I'm wondering how they are being used uh, in regards to patient care, therapeutics, uh, particularly mental health, uh, and or how you anticipate chat bots being used in this industry. Thanks. Thank well, you, Jonathan. Yeah, one of the top bots we, we on our platform is, is like a uh, therapist kind of bot. 
and it gets a lot of engagement. So there's examples out there. I think there's a Stanford professor that has a bot in that space. So there's work there that's uh, promising uh, that I would encourage you to look at. Uh, we can talk offline. Um, yeah, so you have to be careful there. My colleague Steve Warswick likes to rant about um, irresponsible bots that he hates, and one of his um, all-time most epic rants was, I was talking to a medical diagnostic bot, and I told it I had a headache, and it told me I needed a kidney transplant immediately or I would die. It's like, oh, that's, that's a lawsuit waiting to happen. Um, so yeah, I think the best things are not diagnostics, but bots that help in a therapeutic sense, like reinforcing behaviors, like I think you're talking about Wobot. Um, and then also bots can help kind of with the triage angle. So gathering patient data, not diagnosing, but sending it to doctors. I think that's a very cool use case um, that we've seen, but you have to tread very carefully and make sure you're not actually telling someone they're gonna die if they don't do X. Hi, speaking of medical, do you? Uh, yeah, yeah oh, just a, a quick extra point. Yeah, I think, you know, do beware of, of PHI and sort of HIPAA. I think you get into to sort of muddy waters there. But I think uh, there's definitely good examples of the, the therapeutic reminding people to, you know, to exercise or, or to take uh, physical sort of therapy type things, you know, using uh, uh, visuals as well as text or as well as audio there, sort of providing reassurance or information or education can help. Um, recovery and, 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 and various other sort of health uh, treatments. The, um, I think there's also uh, some evidence that people can be more truthful when they're talking to a bot than when they're talking to a human or they can open up around certain sensitive situations. So there's some utility there around providing anonymity and a, and a way to sort of uh, uh, to get to a sort of deeper level of truth than perhaps you can in human engagements. Uh, do you know of any vertical, especially medical, that combines biometrics, especially using the camera with the voice activation for any kind of a diagnosis or anything else, any other use cases that's really using the uh, re facial recognition in combination with uh, voice activation? Yeah, next week we're doing a demo in Norway for smart cities that marries all of those technologies. So it does face recognition, um, very basic emotion recognition, so we can tell if you're smiling or frowning if you leave the frame. Our platform is specifically for handling text in and text out. So once you, you have to combine it with other speech rec systems, other avatar systems, other speech synthesis systems, um, the face rec we're using is from real networks. And it's really, really cool. It's very cutting edge, but I think most of that stuff is still in the demo phase. <laughs> um, how far? Ooh, more tricky prediction questions. Um, I actually think all of that technology is further along than the, than the language understanding side. So like in terms of recognizing your face and knowing it's you, you know, you've, you've been tagged on or you've seen a photo on Facebook that you didn't know you were in and it's like, is this your face? And you're like, oh my God, it is. Stop staring at me. Um, so yeah, I think most of those things will work. Um, this is something that Mark and I actually talk a lot about though, because he does a lot of avatar work. Every, every system you introduce is another fail point for your system. So if you have bad speech recognition, which is pretty good these days, um, like a bad avatar with bad lip sync or uncanny valley that's almost human but not quite, and then the face rec is off, you're just gonna have a bad IVR experience on steroids. So I think that's the ultimate vision um, we're still a little bit of a ways away, but we are doing really cool stuff. Um, like we had to get front-facing camera working for this use case on WeChat. Um, so I think it's coming. Maybe we're going to see it in China first. Okay, next question right here. Hi, thanks everybody. Uh, appreciate all of your insights. A lot of the discussion has been around B2C um, chatbots for customer support. Uh, in the say the next five years, where do you see the B2B space for customer support and what do you think are the biggest challenges? So we're, we're in the early stages of a B2B bot kind of project where we're gonna look at historical data to build a bot. Uh, challenges 
often is that there's less data. So it's going to be less conversations to analyze, um, and that makes it you know, a longer period until you have sufficient data that the experience can be more human-like. So I think it's just a longer time frame. Yeah, I would just add B2B is an equally huge market to B2C, but B2C has been a little bit farther ahead just because in B2B the sales cycles tend to be a lot longer for internal use cases, and we see internal IT teams wanting to build in-house more on the B2C or the B2B side. Um, but it's still a very valid use case. I mean, I think people kind of like internal customer support, so if you have agents um, who normally have to look something up in a wiki, like having the bot assistant agent in chat um, is also something that we've seen a lot of. Okay, I know we have a lot more questions, but guess what? Your question is a great opportunity to use that as your post in the Social Media Minute, which is coming up after this last question. Here we go. Here we go. Hi, again, uh, in terms of verticals, uh, what have you guys seen in terms of uh, uh, bots in education, more like traditional education, as either student or teacher assistants? I can take, I, I mean, yeah, I'll just, I'll just keep talking. Um, we have, uh, we have a really cool education um, use case for language learning in China, actually, that does use an avatar. Um, we did a pilot, or our customer did a pilot um, in 100 schools in rural China teaching them English, and they're also trying to teach um, native Cantonese speakers Mandarin in China. And the test scores of the sample size were through the roof, so actually the government is now backing the project a bit, and it's going into 1,000 schools. And with any luck, you know, I know this is something that investors tell you never to do. Chinese math, don't ever say, if all the people in China spent $1 on my product, we'd have a lot of money. Um, but that type of use case is very promising, and it's just excellent to see the test score results and to see such a controlled environment for testing, which to take a step back, I think is another really important you know, 30,000 foot view takeaway, is make sure you are benchmarking against your traditional channels or traditional ways of doing things in controlled sample sizes and pilots, and then expand out from there. Mm -hmm.